Hi, my name is Julie Huang, and I'm a microbiologist. And today, I'd like to tell you a story about a bacterium that has evolved some really clever strategies to survive in one of the harshest environments in the human body. And this environment is something that we're all intimately familiar with. It's our stomach. So this morning, I had a nice big breakfast, and by now, the food has gone down into the stomach, and it's well on its way to digestion. Our stomach produces a lot of hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes to help us break down the food so that we can get the energy to go on with the rest of our day. But the stomach is also meant to do a second function. The acid is thought to sterilize whatever we take into our body so that we don't end up with food poisoning and other diseases. So for the longest time, because of this idea that the acid is supposed to sterilize whatever we take in, people didn't believe that any living organism can actually live in this harsh, acidic environment. But this idea was challenged in the 1980s. Let me tell you the story of how this happened. So this story begins with two scientists from Australia, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren. And in the 1980s, one of the most devastating diseases affecting people at the time were stomach ulcers. So stomach ulcers are essentially open wounds in the stomach. And in some cases, people were literally bleeding out of these wounds and dying from these ulcers. And at the time, people believed that ulcers were caused by things like eating spicy foods or having too much stomach acid or even things like stress. But Barry Marshall and Robin Warren really wanted to put this to the test and identify what was the cause of these stomach ulcers that were killing so many people. And so they took biopsies from patients that were suffering from ulcers and then looked at it underneath the microscope. And to their surprise, they actually found that there were all these spiral-shaped bacteria found living in the tissue. And so they proposed the idea that perhaps this spiral-shaped bacterium can actually be linked to ulcers. And when they told scientists in the community about this, to their dismay, they were actually rejected very, very quickly. Scientists were really holding on to this idea that the stomach was so hostile, so acidic, that nothing could really grow there. And the idea that it was linked to ulcers, that was something that just couldn't accept. Barry Marshall, being a very persistent scientist, decided that he was going to prove them wrong. So he did the ultimate experiment on himself. He took a vial of live culture of this spiral-shaped bacteria and drank it. And definitely days later, after he had drunk this uh, culture, he started to feel the symptoms that patients with ulcers would start to feel, too. He was cramping, he was vomiting, just felt completely sick. And a few days after he had drank this vial, he took a biopsy of his own stomach. And sure enough, underneath the microscope, he saw those spiral-shaped bacteria that was found in the stomachs of those ulcer patients he had seen. Uh, he didn't let the infection progress to the point that he would develop ulcers. And luckily, because he knew that this was a bacterium, he can take antibiotics to clear this infection. And sure enough, a few days after taking antibiotics, he was cleared of the infection, and those symptoms went away. And most importantly, he never developed ulcers. And so this evidence really was important in linking the fact that there was actually a live bacteria living in the stomach, and it was causing ulcers in these people. And so Barry Marsh and Robin Warren continued on with the study, their studies on this bacterium. And this bacteria eventually was named Helicobacter pylori. And the name refers to the fact that the bacterium actually has this helical corkscrew shape. And the pylori part of its name refers to the fact that initially the bacteria was isolated from the pyloric region of the stomach, which is down here, because this is where the ulcers were happening. And so much of the studies coming um, since then, that seminal discovery, um, have revealed that actually H. pylori is one of the most successful uh, pathogens to infect humans. It actually infects half of the world's population. So right now, one uh, in two people in the, war, in the entire world is actually infected with this bacterium. And it turns out that in about 10 to 15 percent of those who are infected, those individuals will end up developing these duodenal and gastric ulcers, like you see here in this image. Um, but actually, more importantly, perhaps, is the fact that now that we know it's a bacterium, people are able to take antibiotics right away as soon as they're feeling symptoms in the stomach. And so people are no longer dying from things like ulcers.
But there was another link that was really surprising coming from studies that came after this um, discovery of H. pylori. And that was the link of H. pylori with stomach cancer. So stomach cancer is the third leading cause of cancer deaths in the world. Each year, a million case, new cases occurs, and about 700,000 people will die from this type of cancer. And the idea that an organism also causing or being linked and associated to, uh, to a cancer was completely unfathomable until we realized that H. pylori was able to live in the stomach, and it actually gave more, uh, it actually caused people to have a higher risk of actually developing um, stomach cancer. And it's such a bad uh, risk factor that the World Health Organization has actually designated it to be a type 1 carcinogen. So this is as bad as smoking is to lung cancer. And so this is really devastating because so many people are affected um, if they're infected with H. pylori. But what we believe is by better understanding the biology of H. pylori in the stomach, we can develop novel therapies to treat these infections. So why would we need novel therapies when we have antibiotics? Well, that's because antibiotic-resistant strains are cropping up very quickly now. And in a few years, the antibiotics that we have are no longer to, going to be able to effectively clear these infections. So imagine just 30 years ago, people had no idea what was causing ulcers or stomach cancer. And because of the courageous experiments that Barry Marshall did on himself and the studies he did together with his colleague Robin Warren, we now know that there's a bacterium that we can target. And because of their seminal work, uh, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren actually won the Nobel Prize in 2005 um, for, for linking H. pylori to the the, the peptic ulcers and the cause for gastric cancer. So now I kind of want to take us back to uh, the stomach. So as I referred to in the beginning, the stomach is thought to be this very hostile environment because of the high abundance of a hydrochloric acid that the cells release. The hydrochloric acid is really strong. It's as strong as the acid that you find in battery acid, which can corrode even metal. So if you were actually to drop a spot of uh, hydrochloric acid from the stomach onto a piece of wood, it would literally eat through that piece of wood and cause a hole to form. So how in the world are our cells actually surviving in this own harsh acidic environment? Well, our cells are pretty uh, smart too. They're not just gonna produce the acid and, uh, and not have a way to protect itself. So it actually forms also this very thick mucus layer that covers the cells and effectively prevents the acid from ever reaching the cells, um, creating this very well buffered uh, zone. And so this is how the cells of our body in the stomach actually survive the harsh acidic environment. But what about H. pylori? It's not naturally in um, the stomach to begin with. How does it survive? Is it because it's an acidophile? Well, it turns out that it's not. It actually hates acid. And the way that H. pylori has uh, figured out to survive in the, uh, in the stomach is by being able to move and swim using these tail-like uh, flagella at the poles. And that allows it to move away from danger in the environment and move towards things that are good. And for H. pylori, what it's figured out is that the stomach, in the stomach, the cells and the mucus layer is where the pH is near neutral. So it needs to home in into that specific location. So where is H. pylori specifically in the stomach? I first want to orient you to what the stomach topology looks like. This is a cross section through the gastric epithelium or the stomach tissue. And what you can see is that um, at the surface here, the surface epithelium, this is where the mucus as well as the food that we digest would lie. Um, but you also notice that on the top here, there are these openings called gastric pits. And it's through the gastric pits that will lead us deeper into these folds of the tissue that make up the gastric glands. And the cells of the glands are what produces the mucus as well as the acid that gets um, released into the luminal space where our food would be. So if you take a biopsy from an infected individual, and what you see under the microscope is that a majority of the bacteria reside in this overlying mucus layer in a free swimming state. But if you were to look closer at the cells that make up the epithelium, you can also find that there are bacteria directly attached to the cells. 
And this particular population that's adhered and attached to the cells is what we believe is the important um, population that can cause disease. And that's because H. pylori is known to have um, several toxins that it can inject into cells. And upon injection, these cells will essentially get damaged. And a previous graduate student in the lab actually discovered that not only do the bacteria uh, attach to the cells and inject these toxins, they can cause the cells to release nutrients, allowing it to grow and replicate on the cell surface into these really beautiful clusters that we call microcolonies. And so all of this was observed in cell culture, meaning that we were growing these cells in the lab and then infecting them, and we discovered that they can grow on cells. But we wondered, where is this happening within the stomach? So unlike Barry Marshall, most of us don't want to experiment on ourselves to be able to study how H. pylori lives in the stomach. But luckily for us, we were able to develop an animal model using the mouse. So um, the mouse has allowed us to be able to obtain entire stomachs infected with H. pylori. And instead of just seeing the surface part of the stomach, we can now look at the entirety of the gastric glands and figure out where are the bacteria specifically located and growing on the cell surface. And so using a technology called uh, immunofluorescence uh, microscopy, what we can do is uh, label specific biological components um, of cells and be able to visualize where the bacteria are in relation to the epithelial cells that make up our tissue. So what, I want to show you now one of these immunofluorescence uh, sections. So in red, what you're seeing is the outline of each of these epithelial cells that make up the glands. And the blue is the nucleus of each of these cells. The top part here is that mucus layer. And what you can see is that there are a lot of bacteria labeled here in green found in this overlying mucus layer. And you can also see there are bacteria directly attached to the cells. But wait, there's more. When we looked deeper into the tissue, we found that there was actually this population of H. pylori residing deep in the gastric glands. And this particular zone of the stomach was really intriguing to us because this is thought to be where precursor cells reside. Precursor cells are slightly differentiated from stem cells, but still have a lot of potential to form into all the other cells that make up the gastric glands. And so as you can imagine, these bacteria are directly adhered to these precursor cells, and they could possibly be injecting a lot of these toxins into the cells and causing them to die. And in fact, what we have found um, from more recent studies in the lab is that the bacteria specifically located in the glands actually are able to activate the stem cells and cause them to divide more. And increased cell division is one of the really, really um, important steps towards cancer development because uncontrolled cell growth is really the hallmark of cancer. So we really wanted to understand how this population is established. How are the bacteria finding the cells? But before we actually proceeded on with more experiments, we asked ourselves, so all of this was observed in the mouse. And H. pylori is actually a human-specific pathogen, meaning it's not found in any other environmental reservoir, any other animals. So how relevant is this to humans? Could this observation be just an artifact of being in the mouse? So that's the question we ask. What about humans? Is there a way that we can actually obtain human stomachs so that we could figure out whether H. pylori was found deep in the glands? Well, we were really fortunate to be able to establish a collaboration with a team of clinicians and scientists in Mexico. And it was um, really important that we went to a place like Mexico as opposed to going to a hospital in the US because even though H. pylori infects half of the world's population, it um, doesn't infect each country equally. So places like Japan, China, and Mexico has, uh, have a much higher prevalence of H. pylori than in the US. So by going to Mexico, we were increasing our chances of finding H. pylori positive uh, tissues. And luckily, they were able to get tissues from patients that were undergoing gastric bypass surgery. So usually, these pieces of their stomachs were just discarded after surgery. But we asked them if they could send it to us so that we can use our technique to see whether we can find bacteria in these stomachs. And to our delight, we were able to 
observed that there are indeed bacteria in these human stomachs. So what you're seeing here is, again, H. pylori in this mucus layer that overlies the tissue. But more importantly, we saw that the bacteria are also found deep in the glands, um, just like we had seen in the mouse. So this was really exciting because it verified and confirmed for us that this um, discovery we had made in the mouse is completely relevant to humans. And so we uh, proceeded to ask the question of whether there were factors that control pylori's ability to find the epithelium. Because if we could figure out what it's sensing to find the epithelium, then maybe we could prevent it from actually getting there and causing disease. So uh, to study uh, this, we had previous grad students um, that actually were working on this problem. And one of these grad students, Mike Howitt, actually serendipitously discovered a new protein in H. pylori that seemed to control the bacteria's ability to find the specific niche in the stomach. So this protein he called is KeePEP. And what you can see very dramatically in these images is that while the wild type is found in the glands, just like in those previous images I showed you, the mutant strain that doesn't have this protein is no longer able to localize to the glands. It's only found in the overlying mucus layer. So Mike was really, really puzzled by this, but super excited too because he had just discovered this new protein and it seems to control the bacteria's ability to find this niche. So he wanted to know just what is the protein doing for the bacteria? And through his studies, he figured out that this KeePEP protein is actually a member of the chemotaxis pathway in H. pylori. So chemotaxis is a signaling process that allows bacteria and other organisms, too, to be able to sense environmental chemical gradients. And that allows the bacteria to move towards environments that are beneficial for them or, conversely, move away from environments that are dangerous for them. So in H. pylori, chemotaxis starts with the fact that it has four chemoreceptors, these proteins that essentially act as pylori's noses. And these are highlighted in green here in the bacterium. And when one of these receptors senses something in the environment, it relays a signal down to the flagella tails so that the bacteria knows whether to swim towards whatever it's smelling or not. And KeePEP turns out to be a regulator of this whole process. So essentially, the KeePEP mutant was a pylori bacterium with a stuffy nose. It couldn't smell properly. So we knew then from these studies that smelling the environment properly in the stomach was uh, necessary to get the bacteria to the cells. But at this point, I joined a lab, and I wanted to know what were those signals in the environment that the bacteria were actually detecting to find its way to the cells. And so to, in order to study chemotaxis, we actually had to develop a novel um, system, which we call here the microgradient assay. And it essentially, uh, what we did was we repurposed another technique called a microinjection system, which normally is injecting small amounts of things into cells. But instead of injecting into cells, what we use this microinjection system is we load a, chem a needle, a fine tip needle, with our chemical of interest. And we can control when it goes into a live culture of bacteria, which is uh, put in the center of a dish, you can see that a gradient forms in locally uh, uh, in, in this uh, live culture of bacteria. And underneath this dish is uh, a microscope that lets us record the behavior of the bacteria as it's exposed to this chemical gradient. And so one of the most important signals that we have long known that H. pylori is able to detect is acid, as I had mentioned uh, earlier. So acid is a repellent. And we wanted to test whether our assay would be able to show us a repellent response from H. pylori when it is exposed to a chemical gradient of hydrochloric acid. So what you're going to see in these movies here is the response of the wild type strain, which is the normal strain that can sense, uh, versus a strain that is um, a chemotaxis mutant, which is unable to sense. And you'll see that a needle will come in um, on the left side of the video. And when this happens, a gradient of acid is formed. And we can watch the behaviors of the bacteria as they're exposed to this acidic gradient. And what you'll notice right away is that the wild type strain runs away very quickly. Within a matter of five seconds, most of the bacteria have um, moved out of the field of view. Um, but the chemotaxis no mutant, which can't sense, remains in that field of view. And that demonstrates to us that there are two things that it actually shows us. One, pylori is sensing acid as a repellent. 
And perhaps a little more importantly in our case too, our assay works, which rarely kind of happens in science. But this was really great because this now allows us to be able to visualize chemotactic responses in real time. And so in addition to the acid that is thought to help repel the bacteria away from the lumen, I hypothesized that there could be chemicals coming from cells that actually attract the bacteria, which helps them navigate towards the cells. So to test this idea, I took advantage of a relatively new technology called organoids. So organoids essentially allow me to grow a stomach in a dish. This is a way for us to take the most relevant cell type, and in this case, human cell, uh, stomach cells, and be able to create these organoids, cultures in the lab that recapitulates some of the features of the stomach. So a lot of these organoids look like spheres, and this is just an image of a cross-section through one of these spheres. It looks like a hollow ball. So what I did was I took these organoids, which are kind of like our stomachs, um, but in a dish, and I uh, took the cells and washed them extensively to get rid of anything that was sitting with the cells. And then I added fresh media, which then was allowed to condition with the cells. So the idea was if the cells were releasing any compounds, I would be able to collect this in our microinjection needle and then test to see whether the bacteria had any response to this conditioned media. I needed to first make sure, though, that the media I was using didn't have any compounds that would elicit a response. And as you can see from this video, the bacteria could care less. They don't detect anything. But then what about the media exposed to the stomach cells? As you can see, right away, the bacteria are incredibly attracted to this um, gradient of the, the media that had been collected on cells. In fact, they look like they're a total huge bee swarm that's flooding the needle tip. And within a few seconds, you can already see that the bacteria are just swimming so quickly to try to get to this area because they're simply loving whatever is coming out of this uh, needle tip. And this was incredibly exciting for me and my lab because this was the first time that we were able to visualize H. pylori actually detecting and moving towards things that were coming from cells. It had long been hypothesized that there were things coming from cells that the bacteria could be attracted to, but this was our first piece of evidence really showing this. And so at this point, this was a really huge milestone for me. You know, this opened up a whole slew of questions, and I was so excited to dig deeper to understand how are the bacteria doing this, what are they sensing? Um, but one of the strengths of our technique here is that we can actually quantify these videos, even though you don't think it probably needs to be quantified because it's so obvious. As scientists, we do need to quantify things periodically. So what we can do is take these videos, convert them into black and white images, and um, then I quantify the number of black pixels within a certain radius away from the needle tip. And this pixel density is my proxy for bacterial number. So for those two movies I just showed you, this is what the data looks like. On the y-axis is the pixel density, and it's plotted over time from four seconds pre-injection to 30 seconds post-injection. So you can see that in red, wild type responds to the conditioned media very, very well. And there are three different movies represented here in, in these plots. So um, just for simplicity, for future graphs, I want to just show the data at four seconds pre-injection and 15 seconds post-injection as bar graphs so I can show more conditions without obscuring the entire uh, graph. So this is the corresponding bar graph to the data I just showed you. So anytime you see a significant increase in the blue bar compared to the red bar, that means there's an attraction happening. So at this point, I really wanted to know what are the compounds the bacteria are sensing in order to, uh, to reach the cells. And to do this, I decided that maybe if I could figure out what nose the bacteria needed to sense um, this attractant, then I can at least hone in onto a specific candidate that the bacteria could be actually detecting from, from the cells. So I made mutants uh, in each of those four chemoreceptors, the TLP A, B, C, D, uh, receptors, which were the noses for H. pylori. And um, like wild type, the TLP A, C, and D receptor mutants were still able to sense, meaning that told me that these proteins were not necessary for that attraction. But the mutant lacking TLP B was no longer able to detect this. So this search told me that H. pylori needs TLP B in order to sense the cells. So what does TLP B do? 
I decided to look into the literature to see if anyone else had described any other compounds that were being detected by TLPB. And I really only found two studies, and both of them referred to the fact that it was sensing certain compounds as a repellent. And no descriptions of attractants were really published in the literature. And so I realized that what I was seeing, this attraction through TLPB, was a novel compound that no one had described before. And so I was going to have to proceed by doing some more fine experiments to be able to identify these compounds that the bacteria were sensing. But I actually got really, really lucky because at this point, um, this paper came out that described the structure of the TLPB receptor. So what you're seeing here in green is the crystal structure of the protein uh, TLPB. And what this tells us is not only how the protein looks, but what the authors actually found was that in one of these pockets of the TLPB receptor was a molecule of urea that was very tightly bound, actually. And it was so tightly bound that they thought it was just part of um, the protein complex that enabled the receptor to function. But urea is actually a really interesting candidate in the context of my story because we know when cells undergo metabolism, and particularly when they use and degrade amino acids for energy, they need to convert that um, metabolic byproducts into urea, because urea is actually a very stable, non-toxic compound. And we know that all cells in the body have to go through metabolism, because they also need energy to function too. So urea is a ubiquitous molecule in our body, and it's known to be in the gastric juices. So that made us think, could it be perhaps that pylori is sensing urea through its TLPB receptor? And so I tested this idea by taking the conditioned media that had elicited that very cool response, and I treated it with an enzyme that I was able to purchase called urease. And urease is an enzyme that can degrade urea into um, other, uh, other components, and it effectively destroys all urea that comes its way. And so I wanted then to test what happens then when I expose bacteria to that urease-treated um, condition media. I found that that caused the bacteria to no longer respond. So that suggested that pylori may be sensing urea in that condition media in order to find the epithelium. So to test that idea directly, that pylori may be sensing actually the urea um, through TLPB, I put a pure solution of urea into our needle and then watch the bacteria as they're exposed to this urea gradient. And what you can appreciate and see right away is that the bacteria are just simply loving the urea. They are coming in masses and drones. And unlike that other video, you no longer can see the entire swarm within the field of view. This concentration of urea, which is thought to be the concentration in the stomach, is so strong, it attracts almost the entire culture of bacteria to this very small area around the needle tip. And most importantly, this was through the TLPB receptor because the mutant that doesn't have that protein is not able to sense any of it. And so I was really struck by how large this response was. And I asked the question of, well, how low can it go? How little urea can this bacterium actually detect? With one millimolar urea, we saw that really, really uh, massive response. And I decided then to test lower and lower concentrations just to see how low can the bacteria still detect urea? So I went 10 times lower and 100 times lower. And at 100 times lower, at about 10, 15 micromolar, the bacteria were still able to sense the urea. But what I want to first point out, though, is the fact that the urea coming out of the needle tip diffuses actually really rapidly into the solution. And that means that it's getting diluted by the time it comes out to 60 microns, which is where we're still seeing that swarm radius. So that means that the bacteria out here are likely to be sensing urea that's actually much less than that 10, 15 micromolar that we have in the needle tip. And so I really wanted to know what was that threshold concentration. And so I continued testing even lower concentrations of urea in the needle. But instead of the gradient forming um, normally, I pulsed in the solution that I loaded into this needle tip. And in this case, it was 50 nanomolar. And I could see that the bacteria actually are transiently uh, uh, responding to this incredibly low concentration. And you can see here more clearly in these bacterial tracings. 
50 nanomolar is almost a million times lower than that one millimolar solution that elicited that large response. And this was really, really surprising to us because with 50 nanomolar, this is essentially like sensing three molecules of urea in a billion molecules of water. How is it able to still smell that in the environment? When in the actual stomach environment, there's a million times more urea molecules to begin with. You would think that this would completely just overload and saturate the TLPB receptor. You could kind of think of this like uh, going into a perfume shop. Imagine walking in and sniffing your first perfume. It smells great. But you want to test another perfume and see what that smells like. If you were to try to smell a second perfume right after smelling the first one, you wouldn't be able to smell the second one because your nose receptors have been completely overwhelmed by that first perfume. But luckily, we actually figured out that, of all things, coffee beans can actually reset your sense of smell. So after sensing that, smelling that first perfume, you can take a whiff of coffee beans, and that will actually help you be able to smell the next perfume. And so we wondered, could pylori actually have something like coffee beans to help it reset its sense of smell? And thinking a bit more about its biology, we actually realized that perhaps there is such a thing. And this is actually a urease enzyme. So H. pylori's urease um, actually acts just like the urease I had um, used earlier in my experiments. Um, and that the urease effectively destroys any urea that it comes into contact. And what's really striking is actually that pylori dedicates a lot of its energy in creating massive amounts of this enzyme. So why would it want an enzyme, and so much of it, to destroy urea? Well, if we think about the environment, again, that pylori is exposed to when it enters the stomach, it has the cells here at a neutral pH, buffered by this mucus layer. But when the bacteria come into the stomach, they're first exposed to that gastric juice, which has a pH of 2. And not being an acidophile, it can't survive in this acidic environment for very long without having some proper protective shield around it. And effectively, what urease does is create this shield. By having this enzyme, which degrades urea into ammonium and bicarbonate, which are basic compounds that can neutralize the acid, the bacteria have this really, really cool protective shield around it as it's temporarily going through this really acidic gastric juice. And that then will allow it to find its way to the cells, which then, at that point, it's in a safe place. But what we realized is that because it has this urease enzyme degrading urea constantly around the bacterium, the concentration of urea around the bacteria is actually really, really low, even though the concentration of urea in the stomach is at one millimolar. And so we actually were wondering then whether the urease could be acting like the coffee beans and basically keeping the gradient of urea so steep that that will still then allow the TLPB receptor to sense molecules of urea in the environment without being overwhelmed. And so I proceeded to test this idea by making a urease mutant and then seeing whether the urease mutant is able to sense urea or not. And when I tested the urease mutant, I found that it couldn't. So this suggested to us that the urease really is playing an important role in, um, in allowing the TLPB receptor to actually detect urea in the um, environment. And that perhaps without this enzyme, the receptor is then constantly saturated and unable to respond properly. And so to test this kind of on, uh, a, in a different way, we decided that what if we didn't take away the urease enzyme, but instead overwhelmed the system with more urea? So that's what I did in this experiment. Again, at the left, you see the response to the one millimolar. It's very high, meaning that there was an attraction. But if I go and add 10 times more, 100 times more, even 1,000 times more urea into the needle tip, what would happen? I saw that these high, high concentrations of urea actually inhibited the response of the bacteria. So no longer were they attracted, they actually just swam normally. And I didn't see that swarm around the needle tip. And what this told me was that 
at these high, high concentrations, what I'm doing is essentially overloading the system. I'm saturating both the urease and the TLPB receptor. And so that's preventing the bacteria from being able to detect any other molecules in the environment because it's not detecting a gradient anymore. And so we did a final experiment where um, we thought that maybe with a mutant that doesn't have urease, we can actually help it out by adding some um, urease to the outside of the culture. So that's what I did in this experiment. Urease mutant on the left here, you can see doesn't respond at all, just like I showed you previously in the graphs. But in this culture to the right, what I've done is I've added urease enzyme to the culture of the urease mutant. And what you're seeing now is that the bacteria are starting to swarm around the needle tip. And that's told us that, indeed, urease is important for sensing because it generates and helps maintain this steep urea gradient around the bacteria, which is necessary in order for this receptor that's so sensitive to be able to detect new molecules in the environment. So now I'd like to take us back to the stomach. Imagine when H. pylori arises in this very harsh acidic environment. It's faced with many chemical gradients that we now know exist. Um, and then one of these gradients is a hydrochloric acid gradient, which uh, pylori definitely knows to swim away from. But in addition to hydrochloric acid, my research has shown that there are gradients also coming from cells. One of these molecules is urea, which pylori has also evolved a way to sensitively detect this gradient in the environment in order to find its way to the gastric epithelium. And so what does this mean for its uh, life on the epithelium? This means that it can then find its way into these particular niches where it's going to be protected from that uh, very harsh acidic luminal space. And for us, as we're reaching the state where antibiotics will no longer be effective for treating bacterial infections like H. pylori, we now have uh, insight into these novel pathways in its biology so that we can create tar uh, drugs against these new targets, such as chemotaxis components. And that will allow us to um, really be able to develop some more effective drugs to prevent it from successfully colonizing the stomach and establishing an infection. And so with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, Manuel Amieva, and all the members of our lab, both past and present. Um, a lot of the work has really come together also um, with the uh, collaboration with various labs um, across the world, and as well as funding sources that have really enabled me to do this in my graduate um, or, uh, studies. And i really like to thank also the Young Scientist series through the iBiology program um, for really giving me this chance to share my work with you today. And lastly, thank you all for your attention.